Good morning. I'm Vinny Civitello, Communications Manager here at NJBIA. On behalf of the association, I'd like to welcome everyone joining us here both at NJBIA headquarters and online to today's seminar, Lead, Follow, or Get Out of the Way. Before we start the program, I wanted to remind everyone that we are recording today's seminar. Wayne will be happy to answer all of your questions as they come to you, so feel free to shout them out when you think of them, because there won't necessarily be a Q&A at the end. You can also use the chat window at any time to ask a question, and I'll read it out loud. With that said, I'd like to introduce Wayne DeFeo, Executive Director at USGBC, who will introduce the concept of lead building and how the economics of lead building makes both dollars and cents. And how, more importantly, it will introduce how to approach making businesses more sustainable in both environmental and economic ways. Well, good morning, everybody. It's nice to have you join me. This is my first time doing a webinar, so bear with me. I'm used to being able to see your eyes, and I can't do that today. So if you have anything you want to do is make signs, stick out your tongue, feel free, because I'll never know. Uh, I did not promote myself yes. uh, to USCBC uh, chairman or executive director. It is just the New Jersey chapter. Uh, Mahesh, who is our chairman for national, probably would not like that. But I do want to talk to you a little bit about sustainability and lead certification. I want to focus on sustainability, and I want to focus on it from the perspective of a building. The first thing I want you to think about is the simple fact that in a building, think of the building as a living thing. Think of it as a living organism. And it, take your mind right now and put it in that mode. Then I want you to think of it in a way that with people in the building, what role do the people play in this living space? Essentially, you need to think of the fact that we, human beings, in a building are parasites on that building. Think about it. We don't contribute anything except garbage, waste, consume energy, consume air. We give nothing back to the building. Oh, we might maintain it, assuming we don't cut budget. And when you change your thinking process that way, you start to take an entirely new look at what sustainability means. Because if you think of the building and us as a single unit, now how we treat that building will change. And hopefully in return, the building will treat us better. Today we're going to focus on those parts. And why are we going to do that? Because in a study and a statement of 2012, the Green Biz Report, if you notice the comment made, Companies today that are not sustainable, and I'm a biologist by training, so I'm going to change this and say, in my mind, will become extinct. A bit Darwinian. But that's true of business generally. It's a very competitive world. And we are seeing that those companies that are not sustainable, do not engage in sustainable practices, won't survive. In fact, in uh, today's business section, there is a quote, and I'm not quite sure who said it, but one of the hedge fund man managers that's out there is saying that climate change is going to affect everybody's stock portfolio. Now, I don't know if that means it's going to affect it to the better or the worse, but I doubt that he was saying the better. Whether you think climate change is real science, whether you think it's, you agree with the science, th that's up to you. Nonetheless, the business community does agree that it is something to think about, does agree that it is a theory that needs to be dealt with, and therefore one of the things we are going to talk about is how to survive the change. When we talk about climate change, and you're taking a look at your screen, take a look at the 1960 through 2020. There are two different measures of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is a measure from a single point. Had those numbers gone down, I might be a little more optimistic. They are continuously climbing. We're not going to get into geopolitics. The simple fact is we can all affect this in a positive way. And most importantly, what we're going to focus on today is a concept called the triple bottom line. 
You can say that I'm just a bearded old environmentalist. That would be the environmental stewardship column, if you will. But I also recognize, since I run my own business, that economic sustainability is critical. Social responsibility is critical. In each of your businesses, at some point, you will deal with a customer. In each of your businesses, at some point, you're going to have to hire people, hopefully more. And in each of our businesses, we have to deal with the people who work with us every single day and make sure they are as productive as possible in order for us to maintain economic prosperity. Sustainability, we throw that word around a lot. Sustainability in its purest form means you must be environmentally sustainable. You should have a precept of being responsible to those around you. And you must be economically sustainable. Because if you are not economically sustainable, the other two don't matter. You'll be out of business. Very successful businesses today tend to look at these and tend to practice these concepts on a go-forward basis. It's sort of like customer service. We're having a discussion today with staff, and one of the things I reminded them of is a store up in Connecticut, which you may or may not know about, called Stu Leonard's. And he runs on a very simple principle in that store. Literally, his rules are engraved in stone. He has a piece of granite at the front door. Rule number one, the customer is always right. Rule number two, if the customer is wrong, see rule number one. And he has built his entire business, it's a supermarket type business, around those two principles through now three generations. Think about that. How many of our businesses work that way? Sustainability is not much different. Everything I'm going to cover today is proven by some data somewhere. You can disagree with the data. You can disagree with the findings. You can't really disagree with the results. If you look at what economic prosperity really means, how do you turn a profit for years to come? Is there anyone out there that doesn't want to turn a profit? Even if you're a not-for-profit like USGBC, every event turns a profit. Otherwise, we go out of business. And we can't go forward with what we're supposed to do assuming all of you are for-profit businesses who are watching today, you need to turn a profit. Social is a tough one. Social is a bit more nebulous. Everybody understands environment, but what does social really mean? Are you responsible for the person next to you? Are you responsible for the town in which you operate or the county in which you live? The answer is yes. The answer is we're responsible for everything around us. The IA does a good neighbor award every year. Why do they do a good neighbor award? Because they know, business knows, it's good to be good to your community. Think about it. If you engage in action that are socially irresponsible, that hurt your community, how are you economically sustainable? How do you maintain prosperity? It doesn't work. And, of course, there's environmental stewardship. If you are a business in a community and you pollute the environment in which you are working to the point where you can no longer work there, yes, you can get up and leave. That's always an option, and that's been done historically around the world. Let's pollute it so badly, we'll just move on and get out of town. As you know, in business in New Jersey, at least New Jersey, that no longer works easily. We have ISRA, we have potential responsible parties. And to give you context, I work with a client who 40 years after something was done was named a PRP. 40 years. In the end, we, they, we were able to produce documentation that we weren't responsible, but what's the cost? Again, you can disagree, you can say the laws are a pain, you can say we're too strict. I don't really care. They're the law today, and we have to work within them. More importantly, 
If we engage in practices that result in what my old economics professor would say, result in the tragedy of the commons, then we have nothing to do. And for those who aren't familiar with that phrase, most of you may be, I really have no way of knowing that. The tragedy of the commons is a concept based on the original commons, like the Boston commons, where people will abuse the common ownership of an area to the point where it has no value to anybody. Go to a park. You can see that happen when people throw litter. Go to anyone, if you've been to the, dark, uh, the Duke Estate in Hillsborough. If you've ever driven that road, Buck Duke had that wall that you see on Route 206, if you've been there, built to keep people out because he used to keep the grounds open for people to picnic. And they abused it so badly that he hired a security force and built the wall. The tragedy of the common. And that is true of every resource that we deal with around the world today. If we run out, what do we do? Now, I'm going to give you one that will frighten everybody right now. I'm going to scare you all to death. The world is running out of helium. Believe it or not, if you've gone to party shops, what's it called, party supply, they're shutting their stores because there is a shortage of helium for balloons, because there is a shortage of helium. And once we run out of helium, we can't make it. We can't chemically extract it. We need a particular ore to extract the helium. When it runs out, we're out of helium. Now, that's not real important, although it wrecks party balloons and being able to speak with a high voice. But it does matter for certain medical devices and any other number of high-tech materials. So we have to conserve helium. Again, the tragedy of the commons. If we overuse a resource, we don't have it. Now, this is all very introductory, I'm sure. All of you would say, God, why is he talking about this? We know this already. Yes, we all know it. We just don't always practice it. Don't agree with anything I said? Agree with this? How can you argue it? In a study engaged by PNC Bank, they found that if it was a LEED certified branch, they generated more than $461,000 per employee per year than a non-LEED certified branch. And I use LEED because LEED is a way of building sustainable buildings. I don't know what the CEO of PNC said when this was done. This was a third party study. It was done taking into account demographic variations. It tried to get rid of the common baselines and find out this answer. You can look this up. It's not hard to find. You're in business. You're a bank. I show you a way that you can generate $461,000 more per employee per year. What are you going to do? If you don't adopt it, you're foolish. And by the way, if you look at many of the major banks, TD Bank and some others, many of them build to this standard of sustainability. Whether it's LEED, by the way, or well building or living building, there are a number of different ways to build sustainable buildings. Let's talk about the building is the living thing and us in that building. I want you to think back to when you were a child. You were sick. I would lay odds that more than half of you had your parents or your mom, probably your mom was probably the caretaker, open a window, bundle you up, even in the middle of winter. It might stick you under those covers, but open that window. Why? Because they recognized that fresh air was good for you. Now, after many scientific studies, uh, Princeton Hospital, which is up off Route 1, the new Princeton Medical Center, determined that access to fresh air, natural daylight, and views of living things like plants out the windows helped people to heal better. How many of you have plants in your office? How many have views of living things out Not the window? Nope. How many, how many, I don't know what that was. What was that? Uh, how many have views of living things out the window? How many work in cave-like settings? How many of you complain that the air is either too hot or the air is too cold? Recent study shows that women prefer warmer environments, men prefer colder environments. How do we balance that? 
it's not easy. In this particular result, we found that green certified buildings have a 26.4% higher cognitive function score. Why? Because green certified buildings, whatever the green certification is, generally is one of the conditions of green certification require that you bring in more fresh air than the building code. Now think about that. You're in an office. Everybody's talking, walking around, doing their thing. We're all exhaling. We're all generating carbon dioxide. We are in a building that was built to maximize energy conservation without thinking about airflow, and so all the windows are sealed. You can't open a window to let in fresh air, and the air handling systems are old. They're not efficient. They're not designed to maximize fresh air, but they do meet building code. They don't let much fresh air in. Guess what happens? Your carbon dioxide level in a room rises all day long. In fact, by noon, roughly when this ends, carbon dioxide levels can exceed 600 parts per million in most places. When that occurs, you feel drowsy. If you're drowsy, you're not productive. In green certified buildings, we find that because we bring in more fresh air, more outside fresh air, not from the loading dock, you tend to have a higher cognitive function. Well, that makes sense. If you have more oxygen in you, you're, you're more alert. That's exactly what you look for. And we have found this all the way down the line that when you're in a green certified building of any kind, you feel better. Going back to what does that mean? Well, one of the reasons, for example, that PNC found that they were more productive is that fewer workers took sick days because they didn't get sick as often because they had more fresh air. When people work in buildings that are comfortable for them and pleasant, they don't leave the jobs as often. It's not the only factor, but it is a factor. Well, what does churn cost you? Churn rate meaning hiring new pay people. Every time you lose a trained employee, how much productivity do you lose training a new employee? I'm going to ask you a question, and for this I need you to respond somehow. I have to make this interactive to some level. The question is this. Over a 20-year life of a building, I know they last longer, but let's just say 20 years, what is the single most expensive part of running the building? Please give me an answer if you can. Over 20 years, what is the single most expensive part of running the building? We've got Julie who says lights. Lights. Good, good guess. Peter says HVAC. Also a good guess, especially when we get hot, right, and cold in the winter. Anyone else? Oh, come on. Have they figured out V1? Is it lights or HVAC? Is it no, something else? Okay. Wrong. Um, Derek says employees. Exactly right. Derek, you get the rest of the day off. You can go play golf Excellent. and enjoy yourself. You're done. You can leave the <laughs> seminar. You don't need me anymore. Employees account for 90% of the cost of a building over a 20-year period. Think about it. Makes sense. I understand why you say HVAC and lighting, because most of us think of the building as a separate thing. Remember, I started with a precept that we are all part of one living thing. Therefore, our value has to be taken into account, and we know that being in a green building can raise productivity as much as 10% or more. These are from third-party studies. Think about it. If 90% of the cost of a building is the people in the building, and I can raise productivity 10%, what's that worth to my company? It's a big number. We, need, we see something as simple as Good lighting, Six to, almost 7% increase in productivity. How many of you work in a building where the lighting just stinks? It's all different colors. They're all fluorescents. They flicker. Uh, you know, you may have pink. Sometimes they have a pink hue. Sometimes they're bright white. Sometimes they're blue. Uh, you, or you, and you have no windows. You have no natural light to even offset that, right? Some of you do. Even as someone in the room, raise their hand. We'll work on that before I leave. It's miserable. Nobody likes to work under that kind of lighting. 
You, know, you ever see that sickly hue bodies have? People in the office have, oh, God, you look horrible. Well, you look fine when you're outside. Natural lighting, high-quality lighting, and today that's a no-brainer. Today I can create lighting of any hue you want. Any hue, any range, full spectrum. In my office, because I have a basement office, I put full spectrum lighting. In. What does that mean? It means it mimics the sun to about 91, 92% of natural sunlight. Is it better than sunlight? No, but it's certainly better than pink. That's an easy fix. And yet sometimes we don't want to spend the money. If I can make my temperature more comfortable, as I just said, the latest studies show that women and men react differently to temperature. Well, none of us should be shocked by that. If you live with someone of the opposite gender, you know that you're fighting over the thermostat all the time. Because to one person, we're hot, the other person is cold, you're never going to find a happy medium. But you can. Buildings can be designed that way. Thermostatic controls can be put in that way. It costs a little bit more upfront sometimes, but the return on investment is usually pretty darn good. In a study that was done, and don't worry about the absolute statistics here, but what this article is showing is that where you have salaries going from one to the other, you generally get a higher productivity. You get an employee to bring back more than $6,000 a year in added value in their salary if they're in a building that is comfortable. Let's forget LEED certified buildings for a moment. Let's forget well buildings. Let's forget passive house, living building. I don't care what you call it. But so long as it is a building designed around the precepts, that sustainability means not only is the building healthy, but it's economically viable, and it cares about the society in it. The society is the people working there. That's what we're talking about. I have a colleague who once said that the only thing building code really does is make certain the building won't kill you. And that's true. If we look at building codes generally, they're the minimum standard for a building to be safe. They're never the maximum standard. They're never what makes the building best. It's always so that it won't kill you. But that's great. That's better than it used to be. But it's hardly where we should be going if we want productive employees. And companies that have seen this message, if you will, and understand this message, are building more sustainable buildings. Because, again, you're part of the building. We also know that in studies done on lead buildings, for example, going to the economic side, we find that the sales price of a lead certified building is higher than that of a non lead certified building, or at least equal to, compared to Energy Star. Energy Star means it's energy efficient, but that doesn't necessarily mean it maximizes value. Uh, that didn't come out so, so good, did it? Sorry about that. What we found on these studies was that in green buildings, it might show up better on your small screen than it does on my large screen. What we found is that buildings that are built to sustainable standards generally produce higher results in community and inside. We also find that green buildings are more productive. And I'll fly through these because they don't look that good. What's the most important benefit of a green building? Well, that's going to vary by survey. These are surveys, by the way. So these are, these are very much subjective, uh, more than they are objective. But we find that they like the fact that they're in a building that has natural light. The same studies I said that show Princeton shows hospital um, cure rates, what do they call that? Uh, not admission. What's the opposite of admission? Come on. Expulsion. <laughs> Not expulsion. No. <laughs> discharge rates. Now, the discharge rates are better and faster in hospitals that have natural daylight and fresh air. It's the same logic. Your parents were right. When I was a kid and I was sick, it was February, my mother threw me on the back porch, which was an open porch, bundled me up in blankets, and make me stay out there for 20 minutes. Now, you weren't cold because you were bundled up. The fresh air is supposed to be good for you. Well, you know what it is. We don't really need a scientific study for that. We also know that operating costs will decrease. The reasons for building green go to energy, they go to productivity, they go to comfort, they go to employee satisfaction. 
what we really have to think about in that building is we're used to building to what was, and hopefully slowly dying, and hopefully will die faster, a linear economy. That's what we've grown on. The United States built its economy on a linear economy. Extract raw materials, fast, cheap, easy. Make something out of that raw material, sell that raw item, and then move on and throw that item out at the end. In fact, we have built-in obsolescence today. How many have had a new cell phone in the last two years? Most of us have to have the latest and best, the latest and best computers, the latest and best televisions. That's linear. Extract, manufacture, consume, dispose, gone. That kind of economy is dying. It is ending. It is ending in part because of resource extraction's cost. It is ending in part because some of the resources simply aren't there to extract. It is ending in part because people are realizing that long-term sustainability means moving to a circular economy moving to an economy where I can extract a resource in a way that doesn't harm the environment as much. I can make a product that might be durable or at least recoverable, and I can bring the whole thing back. William McDonough, in his seminal work called Cradle to Cradle, talks about that concept. He introduces that by saying, we always work on a cradle to grave. If you think about it from your liability standpoint, if you're environmental officers for your company. You're worried about cradle to grave. Once it was in the grave, it might have long-term liability, and you made sure that minute was minimized. McDonough's concept is make it cradle to cradle. Rather than throwing it away in the linear economy, take and figure out a way to bring it back into the economy in some new use, fashion, or other way so it's productive. A good example of that, paper can be in a circular economy fairly easily. We can recycle paper into new paper. We can take much furniture, a number of furniture brands, Knoll, I think is how you say it, Herman Miller, and others make cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified furniture. And what does that mean? It means at the end of the furniture's life, it can be recycled back into new furniture. It is a whole thinking paradigm that is different. And I would say to you, if you are a manufacturing business, and you're focused on this method of business, then you are, in my opinion, as Darwin would say, moving towards extinction. If you're in this sort of a business, you have a better chance, again, in my opinion, and not just mine, you can move towards being around forever. If you don't use up the resources, but you use them in a way that I can reuse them, I have a better chance to be in a healthy, long-term business. You know, one of the early definitions of conservation, we all talk about conservation. Everybody says, well, conservation means what? Let me ask you, since I'm getting tired. What is conservation? Someone throw me an answer. What's the definition of conservation? You've all heard the word. Go ahead. It means you have to wake up on your end. No one? No one wants to take a stab at it? Come on, I can't even, yeah, I can't see you. How much fun can I make with you? Will says using less. Using less. That's a good, that's, that's a good definition. Anyone else? Only one person awake? Cowards. Using less is part. The literal definition is using wisely. Using less is a way of using wisely. On energy, using less makes the most sense. As a colleague would say, the best kilowatt hour is the one you don't use. That's the cleanest. If you don't use it, you've generated no consumption of fossil fuels or any other form of energy consumption. And yet what we do when we go to energy conservation in buildings or we look at solar, we look at wind, and we go, oh, it's so high tech. I have solar panels on my roof. Oh, isn't that great? Yeah, but did you make the building efficient first? Uh, no. Well, that's kind of an ass backwards way, if I may say, of doing it. Make the building efficient first, then put on the solar panels, if that's what you want to do. So good answer, Will. You don't get the day off for that, though. Only Derek, with his first answer, gets the day off. The materials you pick for the building going to this concept of a circular economy matters. 
And the nice thing is that New Jersey is a leader. Uh, this particular company called Carpet Cycle, in, uh, they're in, where the heck are they? They're in Roseland, I think, and Lindhurst, sorry. Linden, my apologies. They will extract carpet from a building. They take that carpet. They send it through a process. They make that carpet into sound deadening insulation along with recycled denim, blue jeans. And when you look at the carpet, when you look at the insulation, it's all kinds of colors because, of course, the carpet component is all kinds of colors. It has a class one fire rating, so you could literally just have it exposed. And it works tremendously at deadening sand. Costs more than fiberglass, that's true, but it also works better on a lot of levels. If you notice, for example, the woman putting in the insulation is not wearing gloves. You don't need a respirator, you don't need gloves. I've used something like this in my house. It's great. In fact, I had to yell at my electrician for trying to fall asleep in the attic on top of my insulation because it was so comfortable. Made right here in New Jersey, short distance, good stuff. Not hawking the brand, I'm just showing you what is being done. This took years for the owner to develop. In their showroom, we went to a conference room there. We're doing an event there. And people were engaged in a telephone conversation in the conference room. And I could not hear a darn thing outside that conference room. He had it all on the wall, decoratively, kind of buttonhole. It's kind of nice looking. Very popular in restaurants. My point being, it's a circular economy because at the end of that insulation's life, if it is taken out carefully, it can go back and be made back into new insulation. That's a circular concept. That's a cradle-to-cradle -cradle concept. They may not be certified, but it is the concept. What does it mean to have a LEED certified or green space? This is a project that we worked on a number of years ago for a client, not too many. And yes, the colors are bold, but those are corporate colors for the client. So, do we have anyone from PSE and Gion? I don't think we do. Well, I have it by name now. By okay. If anyone's there from PSE and G, just shout out back in, just type in, just say yes. This is one of your buildings that we did for you a long time ago to get it LEED certified. Let me tell you first, the space before was hideous. It was old, dark, dank. The PSCNG is on. Who? PSCNG is, is on. on. Okay. I hope it's Ralph Izzo doing it. I'm kidding. I know he's not on. Look at the space now. Bright, cheerful, it meets with customers. It's a public space. It's durable. Now, there are a couple of green features I want to point to in here, and I want to test you on those green features. Pick any one of them and see if you can identify one green feature. Someone start typing in green features in this space or sustainable features, if you will. Anyone? I can take a stab at it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Vinny. <laughs> All right, so in the middle photo, it looks like we're getting natural sunlight. I'm, I can, I'm seeing this from pretty far away, but it looks That's like... That's fine. We yeah. do have natural light. We could not add windows to the space, but we enhanced the sunlight by putting in better glass. So we do. We have natural sunlight coming into the space. It's very bright at the entrance. We couldn't change the, the length of the building. We didn't have outside walls to put windows in, but yes, that's one. Next. Go ahead. The urinal. The urinal. It's a waterless Water. urinal. Okay. You may not think waterless urinals mean much, <laughs> but every time you use a gallon of water, you consume energy. Because it takes energy to process that water to drinking water standards, assuming you're not on a well. And if you're on a well, you need energy to pump it. It takes energy to get that water to your house to some level, because it has to go through a pump station. And it takes energy to treat that water when you get rid of it, in whatever means you get rid of it because it has to go to a sewage treatment plant, be processed, purified, all of which is a tremendous energy consumption source. Now, just to give you one context, if you live somewhere where your water comes from a river, like near the Delaware here in Trenton, just so you can think about this as you're sipping your water, as some of you may be doing now, the water you are sipping has been through seven other people before you drink it. So it's something to brighten your day. Because water is part of a circular economy. It, the amount of fresh water that exists on this planet is fixed. It is recycled continuously, cradle to cradle. 
It is a resource we cannot make more of. The amount of water on the planet is the water on the planet. That's it. So we recycle it all the time. Go have a sip of water. Any other one? Anyone else want to take a stab? You're going to make me do all the work. I tried. Just like seventh graders, I tell you, which I started teaching. The floor here, this is marmoleum. This is made from linseed oil. We used to call it linoleum when we were kids. Non-toxic. All of the tile has got a recycled content. The carpet is a recycled carpet fiber. The laminates are all non-toxic with no formaldehyde, no volatile organic compounds off-gassing. The wall coverings all have recycled content and have no volatile organic compounds. Any of the glues used in putting things together in this building are zero or low VOC, volatile organic compounds. You know when you have a shower curtain in your house and it's that nice new vinyl smell? Those are carcinogens that you're smelling. Those are volatile organic compounds. So go replace your shower curtain. Everything in here, the furniture is designed so that, number one, it's as close to cradle to cradle if we could certify, and two, it's ergonomic for the people who work there so that they could work more conveniently. About the only thing in here that doesn't qualify as being, if you will, green is the protective glass in front of the cashier that has to be bulletproof so we, or bullet resistant. We can't possibly change that. The lighting is all LED. There was no lighting put into this concept that is not LED. This company will not replace those light fixtures for the term of its lease for at least 10 years. That's a pretty good light. And by the way, that means that those lights don't have to be disposed of as hazardous waste. Fluorescent bulbs, in case you aren't doing this in your business, please tell me you are. If you're not getting rid of your fluorescent bulbs as hazardous waste, you're in violation of federal law. You don't get an exemption. It's bright, it's cheerful, you may not care for the color scheme, but the employees did. And when I do a post-lead building workout, where I sit with the employees over breakfast, and I say, so what do you think of the new space we just moved you into? The first comment I have gotten at every one of these I do is it doesn't smell. It doesn't smell new. It doesn't smell new because even the paint, which I didn't mention, is zero VOC. It won't smell like new paint. The carpet's not off-gassing volatile compounds, which is what gives you the odor. And everybody just looks at it like, this is really nice. It's clean and it doesn't stink. That makes for happier employees. This is not to say people won't find something to complain about. That's inherently the case of people. I don't care what kind of buildings you do. But the other element of this is we gave the employees the choice of color schemes. They picked this. So in the end, they may not like it, but they had input to it because they're part of the space. Another part of a building that we did, another client, if you'll notice, <clears throat> it's no good to just have a green building that's sustainable. We put in education components for the public when they come in. The public is learning as they walk through these buildings what makes this space sustainable? With the goal that they might take that idea home. This is another space we worked on. This is the backyard of a commercial space. And you can see it's gorgeous. You would pretty much want to be out there all day long, right? It's very pleasant. When it rains, you can see how lovely it looks. This is where we took sustainability to the next level. We got students needed an internship from Montclair State University, undergraduate independent study. We worked with them, and I said, okay, design a rain garden. Rain garden, for those of you who may not know, means it takes water in. They looked, they said, we're not botanists, and we'll teach you. Don't worry about that. It's an independent study you're supposed to learn. Again, expanding the concept of sustainability beyond your door, your social fabric. I made them design it without using CAD. They had to hand design everything to scale. They had to come up with plant lists, pricing, you name it. And this is what it ended up as. Here's the before and here's the after. This area flooded constantly because it had poor drainage. This would ice over in the winter. We saw the backyard. 
We took the area that iced over in the winter. This is all permeable. The water flows down underground in the pipes right in the middle of that little planting bed. All those plants can survive water where they can survive drought. The fencing is made from Trex, which is a recycled lumber, which uses plastic bags and waste wood to make the lumber. That fence will never fall down. Take a look at the old fence. Take a look at the new fence. I did not put that chair out there. That, to me, was the ultimate compliment to the students' work. There were employees coming out at lunch sitting there. And I said, why? I talked to them once. Said, You're, why are you doing this? I said, this is great. We have butterflies. We're in the middle of Bayonne. Who the heck has butterflies in Bayonne? And they loved it because it was a comfortable space now. Living space that solved the problem for drainage and was aesthetically pleasing while using recycled materials. In the end, that fencing was the equivalent, based on their website, of using 100,000 bags and turning it into a fence, using, avoiding 10 barrels of oil, and keeping over 1,200 pounds of plastic out of the landfill. That's nice. The plantings keep the space cooler, which means, by the way, lower air conditioning costs. Because if I can keep a space cooler, the air conditioner doesn't have to work as hard. That's why trees have such value. The rainwater stays on site for the most part, the corrected area for drainage. That was the biggest thing. What is one lawsuit worth if someone slipped on the ice in your company? So we avoided the drainage problem. We corrected it by making it aesthetically pleasing. It had a cost. It was not cheap. But the company felt it was worth the investment. And I would tend to agree with them. This is just out of the paper. If you think that <clears throat> business doesn't count, the Atlantic City Convention Center just got LEED certified. And they're going to use it as a marketing tool. Well, duh. Of course you will. Makes perfect sense. Why wouldn't you? All right, remember, economic prosperity. This is using something that's sustainable, a form of sustainable building. And yes, I'm focusing on LEED for obvious reasons. Environmental, building uses less energy, generates less waste. That's all good. And social, you now have a place that people can come to that is more pleasant. The same is true here. You can start thinking, what are the environmental we talked about? The economic, workers can be more productive, and we save potentially, I'm not saying ever, but we reduce the risk of something like a lawsuit. Social, it's just a more pleasant environment. When the building was open, officials from the town came in. They said, this is gorgeous. This place looked horrible before. Well, we can certainly attest to that. Look, it's not big, and that's my point here. You don't have to go big. Look at this. That's not a very big space. It has a very small impact, but a good one. So where do we take this? We recently had our gala for USGBC New Jersey. Some of you may have been there. I am eternally an optimist. If, you weren't, if you're not optimistic in light of the news today, I certainly understand that. Rarely do we have good news come on our phones or in the newspaper or even on TV. This year, we had a group of students who thought up an idea to have a circular, if you will, notebook. It's basically a reusable student notebook. You can write on it, you erase it, you use it again. You write on it, you erase it, the material will just last a very long time. The point is, it's clever. Look at the age of the students. We're not talking adults here. They did a great job in their presentation, did a great job during the award. And it means that you have people in this age bracket and older who are your future customers and clients thinking that sustainability is important. And if you're thinking long term, you can't just be thinking about your customers today. You have to think about your customers going forward. This group here built, uh, if you're familiar with it, it's in Hoboken, and boy do I kick myself for not buying in Hoboken 30 or 40 years ago. How many wish they had bought a small town home in Hoboken 
30 or 40 years ago for 20,000. I think someone told me you could get a townhome by Stevens for $30,000 in the 1970s. I think the last one sold for $5.5 million. I wouldn't be here today, I can assure you. This is a LEED Platinum Passive House Certified Condominium Complex in Hoboken. Now, why would the company build? And these are not cheap. This is not moderate income housing. Right? These things are in the million dollar range on up. They're high-end housing. As far as I know, at least from the last time I checked, not that I was buying one, they were sold out. In construction, I was talking to the architect, and he said during the construction cycle over the winter, it was a very cold day, and you can see there's a lot of glass in those walls. He said you could be in the building on a floor. It was 10 degrees outside, and you couldn't feel anything inside. You were perfectly comfortable. No drafts, no nothing. None of that cold convection that comes off badly insulated glass in our homes sometimes. Passive house takes lead to a higher standard on energy. It means that there is very low energy consumption, that you almost don't even need a heating system or an air conditioning system if it's built correctly. You need very minimal amounts, but lots of fresh air. How do you achieve that? You achieve that through a very high efficiency heat exchange air duct. In this case, I'm not sure about this building, but in passive house design, the air exchanger can extract 95% of the energy that you want to save. So in the winter, it's extracting 95% of the heat while drawing in fresh air that's outside and cold, preheating the air and bringing it into the house. In the summer, the cold air is cooling the air that comes in. Not rocket science. Well, maybe it is. But these don't look too bad. This is over in Union City. And I'm showing all of these award winners to you to get you to think about sustainability from every component. This includes moderate income housing. This was modular. This goes very close to the circular economy concept. Every one of those units came in as a module, which cut waste way down in construction. If you've seen a prefab home, we're not talking about trailers, we're talking about prefab buildings. Super efficient in construction. You can do prefab offices. There is a company called Dirt that is a member of our organization. They make prefab office suites. It's amazing what they can do on a prefab basis. What I like about this project in particular, it goes to the social responsibility. Because there is a moderate income component, they have a communal or community kitchen structure in it where they will be doing lessons on healthy cooking for the residents of the building. Thinking not just about giving people a good living environment, which is of course nice, but how they can take sustainability to that one level of the one building, so to speak, that all of us have to take care of, and none of us probably do correctly, this, our body. So it helps people to be healthier over the long term. Corporations, all right, that's housing. But what about corporations? Are you in corporations doing well? Super is a pretty big corporation, right? I would say. Not too small. Brand new buildings, thinking again. They're looking about, number one, they're in Camden. They stayed there. Number two, they built a building to standard. It's a LEED certified building. By the way, all of our winners have to be LEED certified, even honorable mention. And they determined that the building, look at this, look at the natural daylight coming into this building. Again, how many of you right now are sitting in a space with natural daylight streaming through to help the plants growing near your desk do better? Right. When you guys leave here in this room now, are you going to well, go back? Well, the shades are down. So. Well, yeah, our shades are down here. <laughs> but this isn't your office either, is it? <laughs> and taking it to community again, a school. This is a new Votech school in Hudson County, built to lead standard. First of all, that this is Hudson County with that much green always amazed me. <laughs> you never think of Hudson County having anything green in it. I don't mean green environmental. I just mean green plants. Not only is a school sustainable, not only did it incorporate the concepts of a healthy building, an energy conservation-based building, a building that uses zero VOC components, it's going to, going to be teaching the next generation of vocational experts, the people who are going to take and maintain, build, and otherwise work in our buildings, and put them in a living laboratory. 
What better way to teach somebody? Long term, makes more economic sense. A school will be cheaper to run. From an environmental standpoint, we've already discussed that. From a societal benefit, I want my plumber to know what's going on if I want to do something sustainable. I want my electrician to understand this new lighting in my commercial building. I don't need someone coming in saying, ah, put in the old stuff, it's cheaper. It's not really cheaper anymore, by the way. Lead, LED lighting, about the same price as anything else you can put in. Unless you want to go whole hog and put in computer controlled light panels. That's a whole separate game. Hudson, Hudson County, again, Hudson County took the bulk of the prizes this year. I don't know why. This is a park in Hudson County, in Hoboken, designed to control stormwater. So rather than just putting in some hideous culvert that has absolutely no use, <laughs> the development decided, let's make it a public space. Let's make it something pleasant to look at and control stormwater simultaneously. Doesn't that make sense? Um, hopefully, many of you have been to Boston, I assume, over the years. If you've ever been to Boston, walk around downtown. And if you can ever get a tour, you will be amazed at how many of what you think are parking garages, and indeed are, are actually parks on top. Because Boston has taken a lead in doing this. Not, that's an LDAD. And they've built a lot of parking structures with parks on top with full-grown trees. Careful engineering, as I might point out, because the tree has to be over the support column that goes underground. All designed to help with stormwater, make the space more pleasant rather than some just rectangular parking deck that looks hideous, help with cooling the city, avoiding heat island effect. Montclair State, students working, uh, PSE&G Institute for Sustainable Studies. You can't even get into how much stuff they're doing. The green teams are going out there and doing community work, working with hospitals, working with schools. And here's where we all fall down. I go through all the trouble. You go through all the trouble. Your consultants go through all the trouble. Your companies, they build this wonderfully green, sustainable, passive house, living, building, et cetera, et cetera, space. And the next day, someone brings in a bottle of Clorox to clean the bathroom. Which sort of, and I have nothing against Clorox. But using any bleach is not going to meet a green cleaning standard. The fumes don't help. And we've had a lot of problems with a couple of sites where the waterless urinal that you correctly pointed out earlier stopped working. Well, that's because they were using standard cleaning products, and you can't do that. You have to use a cleaner that doesn't destroy the little gel pack that you put in them. You should be thinking about companies and your own, if you do it at home, that don't use caustic, things that are harmful, things that can generate gases that are harmful. We just had this occur in Essex County. We've got three chlorine explosions at a household hazardous waste event. Small ones, but hazmat was called in. This company specializes in using green cleaning practices. It's just someone who won an award. It's very innovative. I'm not telling you to hire anybody. I'm just showing you examples of what can be done. Internally, you could do it yourself. Are you thinking about that? Cleaning is always an afterthought. Nobody wants to think about cleaning. It's always, in fact, their closets are always too small. They're always stuck in a corner. No architect wants to think about that, which should be. Kogay Pamalov is going for triple zero. Again, New Jersey-based company. What does triple zero mean? It means zero water use, zero energy use, and zero waste generation. They're trying to have their building produce no negative outputs and consume no net energy. When I mean no energy use, that means no net energy. What it means is they want to generate as much energy on the building as the energy consumes, which would theoretically make them off grid if they so chose. Zero water, same thing. If they're going to do landscaping, I'm not saying this building per se, but what you would do with a landscape system is put in rain cisterns that are underground. They catch the water when it rains. You have to irrigate when it's dry. You've already collected the water you need to irrigate with. You don't need outside water to do that. Remember, every time you use a gallon of potable water, you consume energy off-site. Zero waste, making it so that they're 
Everything they're doing in that building can be recycled easily. That's the goal. It's not easy, but it can be achieved through hard work. In the end, it will save the company money. And don't think a company like this, or Subaru, or any of the other companies I've shown you, or the residentials, aren't marketing based on that. Because consumers, we know in almost every single study, will, a certain branch, not every consumer, will go to those companies first. Take Patagonia if you, if you have outdoor gear. They are very big on marketing their sustainability. Unilever's project, again, commercial space, thinking ahead, look at that atrium. How many of you wouldn't like to have that in your, if you have a large commercial building? Wouldn't prefer that? Living plants, real plants, not plastic. How many times have I been in a large commercial atrium to cut costs? They've gone to all fake plants. They have this beautiful atrium. will support any living plant you want to throw in there. Everything's plastic. And it looks like plastic. <laughs> and it's all dusty. It extracts dust. Plants clean the air. They create oxygen. Living walls are a concept that you may have seen around, where it's a green wall of living plants. And it, it's great. People like them. They look better. They feel better. The air is cleaner. It works very well. Not bad. Timing was pretty good. Yeah. Now, do you have any questions while we have a few minutes left? Oops. There we go. Let's just leave up an image at the end. None? At all? Well, it's lunchtime, so let's see. So you've killed an hour at work just before you get to go to lunch. That's a pretty good deal. So here's my advice to all of you. If you are in a place right now where it's possible, instead of going and eating at your desk, do something that's sustainable and healthy. Get up, get outside, and go for a short walk. You don't have to go running unless you want to. Go outside. Get some fresh air. Because every other study I've read shows that if you take that short, it doesn't have to be a whole hour, take some time outside and get up and move yourself around, you will be more productive in the afternoon and be less likely to fall asleep at your desk. Thank you all very much for your time. If there are no questions, then I think we can close out our webinar. Sure. We hope you enjoyed the webinar today. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Wayne and USGBC for their partnership in today's program and to wish all of you a great day.